Thank you, Kevin. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends. It's good to be here. Well, my paternal grandmother, Nellie Russell, was 93 years old when she died about 30 years ago. My father was just shy of 88, 89 rather, when he died about 12 years ago. But my father's younger brother, Ron Russell, he's still living and he's the longest living, surviving member of my father's generation and he's turned 90. Now according to Wikipedia, which is a great source of information, the oldest living person in the world today, or actually at the beginning of this year anyway, that's as up to date as that, is a Japanese woman aged 116 years. And the oldest living man, guess what, he's also Japanese. There must be something about their diet and their genetics and things, but he's the oldest living man today and he's 113 years old. And according to Wikipedia again, the oldest person ever whose age has been verified, that means by modern techniques, according to modern methods, is Eugène Calment of France. Born 1875, died 1997 at the age of 122 years and 164 days. But when we read the Bible in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 27, we read there that Methuselah lived a total of 969 years and then he died. Others who lived about that same period of time in the Bible history, um, they were similarly long lived, though Methuselah's lifespan is the longest recorded at 969 years. Now is this credible? And in any case, what does it matter really? Many people dismiss these things just out of hand. They treat this as legendary, together with the Bible stories of that period, the story of uh, creation, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the story of Noah and the Great Flood. Well, tonight I intend to talk about Methuselah, but I also intend to delve into related issues around that and try and get a better understanding of what happened and, and consider its credibility. Now, um, what I'm going to do is um, uh, I want to give some acknowledgements first of all, then I want to look at the Bible account in some detail. I want to analyse the lifespan records that are there in the Bible. And then I want to consider some science, um, the effects of ultraviolet light and ozone. And I want to consider what the pre-flood conditions may have been like from the information that we've got. I want to then look at some evidence from geology I want to consider the uh, issue of ice that's currently on the Earth and the polar regions in particular, and also astral ice, that means ice outside of the Earth's environment in space. Uh, we'll get to that. And then I want to consider some other Bible statements before I draw implications from all this and a conclusion. So, acknowledgements. I want to acknowledge a book that I inherited from my late father, Frank Russell. It's called The Biblical Flood and the Ice Epoch by an American writer, Donald Wesley Patton. He's uh, lived 1929 to 2014. He also wrote quite a number of other books. Now, I don't currently have this book on my shelf. I did have it, but I've given it away. However, this book in its entirety is available free of charge on, on the internet if you search for it. Um, I haven't read it in its entirety, but I have read a great deal of it. And I was first fascinated by this book in my teenage years and have picked it up much more recently. In particular, relevant, of particular relevance for us tonight is this chapter nine, the greenhouse effect, the antediluvian canopy. Antediluvian simply means before the flood. And it's section seven, the curve of declining longevity after the flood with its figure 25. We'll get to that um, later on. Now, Patton was an American Christian. He was a geographer by training with a lifelong interest in ancient history, ancient literature, climatology, genetics, geography, geomorphology, mathematics and philosophy, quite a wide range. And uh, he lived in Seattle, he received BA and MA degrees, he wrote several books including this particular one. Now I want to quote uh, from his um, pref 
prefatory note because this really sums up his thesis, which by the way I do find very plausible, though I don't think it necessarily is the final answer about these things. So I'm not presenting, I'm not representing Patton's material because I take it as absolute gospel, but it is very reasonable, I think, and very thought-provoking, and I hope you find it so too. So just considering what he wrote in his prefatory note, he says, the, the central proposition of this book is to demonstrate the superiority of the theory of astral catastrophism. Astral meaning catastrophe that comes from outside the earth, some, something that's come on the earth over and against the uniformitarian view of Earth history. That is, that things have been going on almost forever in just the same way that they go on today, that nothing extraordinary has ever really happened. Astral catastrophism involves occasions of sudden and overwhelming cataclysmic changes in the conditions of the Earth in a brief and limited time. Among the cataclysmic forces which engaged our fragile sphere were both gravitational and magnetic forces of planetary magnitude. The results included tidal waves of subcontinental proportions or dimensions. We do not maintain that the period of crisis referred to in Genesis as the flood was the first conflict or the last. We only maintain that it was the worst. So he thinks that things like this, like he postulates about the Genesis flood, um, happened prior to that time and since as well, but uh, of lesser magnitude. This has been the most significant event in the history of the Earth of that nature up, to, up until now. Along with oceanic tides, other results included the upheaval of tides of magma, resulting in mountain systems on a global scale and in a global pattern. It was simultaneously the dumping of vast, a vast volume of extremely cold astral ice, these ice from outside the Earth, upon the Earth's high latitudes, but essentially in the magnetic polar regions more than in the geographic polar locations. Also, there occurred a sudden and permanent change to, in the Earth's atmosphere, and hence the Earth's climatic organisation. Thus, there was a new and markedly different physical environment for biological life. This is his thesis. I think it's a pretty good summary of all that he presents in his book. Celestial catastrophism, or as the author uses the term, astral catastrophism, involves a sudden engagement and disengagement of these forces, acting simultaneously upon each of the Earth's three fluid equilibriums. The atmosphere, that is the air, the hydrosphere, the oceans, and the lithosphere, primarily fluid magma or lava. That sums up um, what he had to say. Uh, now, uh, I also want to acknowledge some other books that um, I've read or partly read a long time ago and have had a look at again. Once again, I don't have these currently in my possession, though I did. I must have given them away at some stage, but they are uh, these are not accessible on the internet. You can get copies though. So there's, um, this is, um, the writer is Emmanuel Velikovsky and um, he wrote three books. First of all, Worlds in Collision, this one here. In 1950 it was published and postulates the near approach of a planetary body to Earth in about 1500 BC in his um, thinking. Evident, and it covers evidence from ancient mythologies and religions. The second book he published was, um, sorry, was Ages in Chaos, here, um, in 1952, and that was based upon a reconstruction of ancient histories from all around the world and finding what they pointed to. And then the third book, which is probably more relevant, called Earth in Upheaval, in 1955, and that covered all the relevant geological evidence for these kind of future, these kind of past events. Velikovsky was uh, an American uh, Jew of Russian origin. He was a qualified doctor and an independent scholar that he described himself as. He lived from 1895 to 1979. He did have some connection with Albert Einstein, and he helped form the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was and remains a controversial figure in scientific circles. 
Okay, so I've had some input from that. And then since, the, since I've prepared all this talk, I've been reading some other books, which I have with me tonight. Uh, I've uh, finished reading this one, The Deluge Story in Stone by Byron Nelson, published all the way, all the long time ago in 1931, and then re again in 1968. So it goes back quite a long time. That was much more interesting than I thought it would be. I've had that on my shelf for a very long time, but I've finally got round to reading it. And it covers all the interpretation of uh, the geological evidence and the thinking of people about these things uh, right up to then modern times. It's, it's very good, actually. And then I've, been, I've partly read this one here, The World That Perished by John C. Whitcomb. That was published in 1973. Okay, so they're my acknowledgements. Um, now let's, anyway, get on to the subject material, and in particular, Methuselah's lifespan that I mentioned, 969 years. So we come to the Bible, I and mean, the first book in the Bible is Genesis, and the book of Genesis is all about origins, which is what the name Genesis means. So the book, uh, 50 chapters, it covers the origin of the universe, the origin of the earth, the origin of life on earth, the origin of mankind, and in particular the origin of the nation of Israel, which then becomes the major subject of the, uh, in the rest of the Bible. And its first 11 chapters out of those 50 um, cover a huge time span from creation up to the birth of Abraham at about 2200 BC. So there's a lot compressed into those few chapters. The book is chronological in arrangement. Now let me just briefly summarise. It tells the, of the creation of Adam and Eve, the first human pair, and it records two lines of male descent from that original pair. Firstly, a line through Cain, um, who was the one who murdered his brother Abel, and because of that there was another son who uh, was virtually replaced Abel. His name was Seth. So the, 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 one, the, the line of interest is the line through Seth, and it covers generation by generation the descent through from Adam and Eve through Seth down to Noah, ten generations later. And after the account of the flood in Noah's time, this uh, genealogy continues and it continues all the way on to Abraham, another ten generations after Noah. And the information in these genealogies uh, that, are, that are presented in the Bible, it's a bit like their ancient version of our registry of births, deaths and marriages. So I just record some basic information there about different people. The information usually includes for each man the age of the father at the birth of the son of interest and then his total length of life. Anyway, let's look in more detail at this information. What I've done here, um, I've tabulated uh, the, the, the information that I want to present tonight. Uh, and it's in preparation for, for a graph to come from this data. So I've got a table, it's very simple. Here's the generations down there on the left. There's the name of the person from Adam through his son Seth to Enosh, Canaan, all the way down here to Noah at the 10th generation, okay? Here's the biblical reference. You'll see that nearly all of them, the first nine, are all from Genesis 5, just successive verses in Genesis 5 because it's just listing one after another. And here's the recorded age at death. Adam living 930 years, Seth 912, da 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 da, down to Noah at 950. And here's Methuselah at 969 years. So far, so good. Okay. Now, just a few points to note before we proceed to on with this. Enoch's life ended prematurely at the, at the very young age of 365. But there's something odd about his life. Once again, the detail is extremely limited, so we don't know exactly what happened. But it does say of Enoch that he was no more because God took him away. What does it mean? Did he even die? You know, we don't really know. But something happened. It does, it, it probably correlates with what was happening in the other line, the line through that wicked Cain, because there's a fellow at just that same level as Enoch he was very boastful about how he'd slain somebody and how he'd uh, threatened anybody who he perceived as a threat, he would deal with them in the most vicious way. So, and that's the same level. So that's all we know, though. Okay? Um, but anyway, so Enoch's a special case, 
at 365. And another thing of interest is that Methuselah here at 969 years, when you calculate it out, he died in the very year that the flood came. The flood came in the 600th year of Noah and that's just on that 969 years. So was that some kind of sign that the flood was just about to come? And another factor, Lamech, his son, died shorter than most of the rest at 777. He actually died just five years prior to the flood. And there's something interesting recorded about what he said. It's a kind of a prophecy about the conditions at the time and that, there, and that God would send rest through their son Noah. And his name literally does mean, Noah means rest or comfort. So there seems to be something prophetic maybe about his death even. So what I've done, I've, I've asterisked those two. So disregarding those two, the average of all those ages is 929. So all pretty steady about the 900 year level, okay? Now let's continue this table for the next gen 10 generations. By the way, anybody can do this. The information's just there, you just pick it out and um, you can create your table and from that a graph. Let's keep going. So this here is in Genesis chapter 11 and you see you need two verses to work out what the age was at death in this case. But once again, it's generational going right down here to Abraham, who's a very notable character in Bible history. It's all in Genesis 11, except for Abraham a bit later, and I can just list the ages at their death. Now, can I just mention a couple of other things uh, about this? Um, uh, oh, hang on. Well, but just before I do, we'll just... Um, we'll just um, I just go on with this table, there's another page yet, because after Abraham we can keep going down through the generations, his son Isaac, his son Jacob, and so on. Now Job uh, is not in that line, Job's in another part of the Bible, and we, nobody knows exactly where Job fits, but there's many indications that he lived at this patriarchal period, possibly in the same time as Abraham, and you see I've recorded there his his, that, that's why he's listed at that point in the table, um, but he's co coincident probably with the patriarchs just before, just listed before him, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And there's a record there at the very end of Job saying that after this he lived 140 years. It's not really clear whether that means he died at 140, or does that mean that after his experience, all this suffering and trial that he had that the whole book of Job's about, that after that was over and resolved, he then lived another 140 years. Probably that's what it means. So let's guess he might have lived 180, 190, which would put him up... Come back here. Um, that which would mean that he lived uh, a similar kind of age to uh, Abraham here, uh, with whom he may have been contemporary, or with Isaac, and so on. That, but I've just put 140 question mark, okay? Going down through further generations, these are all generational here. Uh, Jacob's son was Levi, his son was Kohath, Am Amram, Moses. Okay, there, and I've listed their ages as recorded in the Bible when they died. Uh, Joshua, I put here, Joshua was the successor of Moses, but he was not in that same line. So I've called him Generation 27, but questioned it because we don't know his ancestry way back where he fits in, but he died at 110. Uh, David was in that line, uh, not, not from uh, Moses, but he was in the line from Jacob, uh, this level. Uh, he's generation 33, and again, it records of him, I think this is the age of his death, it does say that he was 70, and it sounds like from the context that that's when he died. It was when his reign ended, that's for sure, and the next king uh, took, took over. So I think he's 70. Uh, Eli was just before that time, and he... Uh, I've listed him as the 32nd generation. He died at 98. Now, an interesting thing about this, we don't know for any of them how their death came about. What was the cause of death? Did they just die of old age factors or was there something else? We do know with Eli that although he was very old and very heavy, he fell over backwards and broke his neck and so died. So that age at 98 was an accidental death, but it sounds like he was pretty close to the end of his life uh, at that point. Okay, so I think that summarises the information I wanted to present. Um, now, one further thing about these lists. We don't actually know whether all generations are included in the list, especially the first 
10 generations that I showed and maybe the next 10 as well. There's, there's some may have been omitted for reasons which are now unknown, so people can argue about it. Because when it says that X became the father of Y, it doesn't mean strictly father as we understand it. It might mean, uh, it can occasionally mean the progenitor of. So it is definitely the direct line. It's like me saying I'm the, I'm the, I'm the father of Dominic when he's actually my grandson. So I'm the father of Richard, he's the father of Dominic. But, you know, we use, the, we use father a little loosely like that too at times. So it's not something peculiar to the Bible, but it could, it doesn't strictly mean that it's uh, father, literal father and literal son, but it's in that same line. Uh, okay, um, so there does seem to be something stylized about these lists because there's exactly 10 generations from Adam to Noah and another 10 from Noah to Abraham. And, and there's some, you know, there's evidence elsewhere in the Bible, including the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, that there indicates they have an interest in numbers, making numbers like this. Doesn't mean that the, the, the genealogy is fictitious, but it does mean that it, uh, particularly, there might be some generations missing because they want to make these numbers uh, come about. You know what I mean? Okay, so, but in any case, even if that's the, so, it won't make any difference to the argument that I'm presenting, okay? Now there's two Bible quotations which are relevant to this. Um, hang on, let's just go back here. I think I had Bible quotations here. Yes, here we go. Um, that relate to the longevity of, uh, of man. Uh, back in Genesis 6 verse 3, this was right at the beginning of the narrative about Noah and the coming flood. God says to Noah, to, through Noah, or God says to Noah, my spirit will not contend with or remain in, that's an alternative translation of those, the original words, my spirit will not remain in man forever, and you, man needs his God's spirit in him to live. The Bible record is that without God's spirit in us, we would just simply die. We need God's spirit to live. So he says, God says, my spirit will not always remain in man forever, for he is mortal. Another translation of mortal is corrupt. He is corrupt. His days will be 120 years. So back in this period, when they're all living about 900 years, God says they get, their days are going to be 120. And then there's another one, much later, in the Psalms, uh, the wisdom literature of the Bible, there's a psalm that is attributed um, to Moses, um, whom we've mentioned already, and he writes this, Our days may come to 70 years, or 80, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Okay? Now what I want to do is take that data I've presented in those three tables and plot it and draw a curve. And this is just what Patton does in his book. And when I first saw this, I was quite astounded uh, by it. And I, I hope you will be too. There it is. That's here from his book. And what he's done, he's plotted the generations on this axis here, all the, de all the information that I've just put to you. And here on the vertical axis is the, de the date recorded at the, uh, the death of the, the, that character down, down here. And you can see this line marks the flood in Noah's time. And here's the ages beforehand. The average is actually 929, discounting Enoch and Lamech here. And after the flood, this is the point. You can see it's a scatter of data, but it doesn't badly, you know, it's not a bad uh, fit. The, for, a, for this curve here. Now notice that it's not a step change. It doesn't drop straight down here to either 120 or to 70 years. And it doesn't go on a straight line like that either. It's, it's just a scatter of data, a scatter of points like this. And this is not a, it's not a, it's a pretty reasonable curve considering those data points. Now if you we recognise, particularly those of a science background or engineering background like myself, that that's a, a, a curve, a special curve. It's a, it's a um, exponential decay curve, okay? Now, that's quite interesting. It's when it's done generation by generation. Now, let me just quote to you what uh, Patton says about this. He says, this curve required over 30 generations and more than 1,500 years until the new norm of three score and 10 or 70 years was reached by the descendants of Noah. 
This curve suggests that cumulative factors, rather than single factors, were involved in causing the change in the rate of ageing. This curve is a common type of decay curve, as I've mentioned. And uh, he expresses himself a bit clumsily here, but I think you'll get, along with me, what he's talking about. It can be plotted, the same curve, by subjecting bacteria to mild, but non-lethal, as long as it's non-lethal, but mild levels of germicidal ultraviolet radiation. So you've got a whole lot of bacteria in the container and you subject them to ultraviolet light and you turn up the level of ultraviolet light. You can, you'll end up, if you plot certain things, you'll end up with a curve like that until a new norm is established for this new level of radiation, as long as it's not lethal, okay? So, um, that's very interesting. Um, and then pattern goes on. It can also be achieved, a curve of this nature, by subjecting fish to ozonated water. Interestingly enough, he goes on, it has also been found that ozone, an extremely toxic gas, can accomplish this same transient decay curve chemically upon human cell tissue. Now, well, I think we know all these things. We're very aware of, um, about the ozone um, know the, uh, and, and, and the ultraviolet light. Um, but Catton brings these together. This is back in 1968 he's writing this. Laboratory studies with ozone have shown that this molecule reacts with amino acids and proteins, with nucleic acids and their derivatives, and with other compounds, all of which are biologically essential. Ozone, a radical form of oxygen, it's O3 instead of the usual O2, can also disrupt chromosomal material, something accomplished chemically, which may also be accomplished physically by ultraviolet radiation. Later he says, the resulting curves, he's talking about some uh, demonstrations and some experiments that were done and curves were plotted of, of these things, both to do with UV light and, um, and also with ozone. He says, the resulting curves were also of the transient decay type, of course. Ozone, even when ingested in parts per 10 million, has a tiny but nevertheless toxic effect and as a chemical radical will react and injure many types of tissue not excluding germ, that is reproductive tissue. Okay, so um, that's essentially um, what he thinks was around the issues involved with uh, the flood. So let me expand on that a bit. Patton thinks that the Earth's climate prior to the flood was vastly different from what it was afterwards, and that at the flood, drastic changes occurred to the atmosphere and hence to the climate and this UV light and the ozone are very significant in his mind in relation to that. Patton points to geological evidence that shows there was once lush vegetation over much, if not all, of the earth, including the polar regions and including locations which are now desert. So there was lush tropical or semi-tropical vegetation virtually over the whole earth and there's evidence for that all around the place. I, I, I can't bring that to you. Um, I can't bring that to you tonight, tonight. In fact, there are considerable deposits of coal near the North Pole and the South Pole as well. They're quite considerable. There's, there's coal in heaps and heaps of places, all manner of places, some vast deposits. How did coal form in these polar regions? He also refers to evidence, uh, and this is, I found very astounding when I first came upon this in his writing and Velikovsky's as well, evidence of vast frozen mass graveyards of literally millions of woolly mammoths and other large creatures in islands off the northern coast of Siberia and also in Alaska. In fact, in Siberia, their tusks, which are ivory, have been harvested for a couple of hundred years and massive amounts of ivory uh, have been uh, generated from there and sold into markets in, in Asia and the world, okay, from these woolly mammoths. Now, woolly mammoths, they are woolly, but they're, they're really like an elephant. They're related to elephants, it would seem, and to bison, that sort of thing. Um, they, uh, they are great grass eaters. They need enormous amounts of vegetation every day uh, to survive and they look like they were once in a, at least a temperate region, if not subtropical, um, that's, the, that's the kind of place they would have once lived. 
However, there's these huge graveyards, and they're, they're packed up there um, on these islands and in the northern part of Siberia and in Alaska. They, have, they appear to have been suddenly snap frozen so rapidly that the contents, uh, that their flesh has been preserved of these big animals and the contents of their stomachs have been preserved too without, without rotting. So that when they analyse them today, they can work out, well, what were they eating? Uh, also, stuff in their, in their mouth, apparently, too. They can, they can get the stuff from their teeth and around their tongue and everything, as well as what's in their stomach. And it's all been preserved in millions of these beasts which have been frozen from that day, from some day, when that happened, right up until the present time. So apparently, you can still eat a steak from these woolly mammoths, if you want to. Uh, I've fed it to dogs and I believe some people have eaten it as well. How did all this come about? All these creatures, and masses of them, huge herds, gigantic herds of them, snap frozen in some point in time. Now Patton goes on and he draws attention uh, to the huge extent and immense depth of ice in the polar regions. And in fact today, uh, although it's the polar region extremely cold, uh, there's very little precipitation in the polar regions. There's actually, the atmosphere is actually quite dry. And if there ever was, if there was snow there, you'd expect it to fall mainly on the edges and to accumulate on the edges. However, the ice is not like that. It's vast in extent and it's deepest in the middle. It's extremely deep. In the northern, uh, over the northern pole, it's um, in the, at the northern pole, it's over uh, water. The south pole is over bedrock. And the centres of the polar ice actually more closely align with the magnetic poles than they do with the geographic poles, which is interesting too. How come? How did all this come about? Patton thinks that the flood catastrophe was caused by the near approach of a heavenly body to the earth and that the, all these effects have come from that. Now let's look a bit further at Genesis uh, okay, that's the, I've, just, I've just put the quotation there um, that I read to you. Um, I want to talk about some uh, texts in the, in the Bible. So let's go through some of these uh, here because when we look carefully at the detail that is recorded, even though it's so brief, the, you get a consistent picture uh, in Genesis. And I want, this is what I want us to see tonight. After the flood, God gave a rainbow as the sign of the covenant that he would never bring such a flood on the earth again. The way it is written, uh, this is just you know, quoting, quoting from Genesis 9, after the flood's all over, God says, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign, whenever you see the rainbow, you'll re realise God sees that and he remembers the covenant, he won't do this again. Um, now the way it's written, it's as though the rainbow's never been seen before. Now, at least in the sky, anyway. So nobody had ever seen light diffracted from uh, droplets of water in the, in the heavens. So if that's the case, it indicates that the atmosphere must have been very different so that no rainbow would, be, would appear until after the flood. After the flood, it's different. Okay, so it suggests that it's a new phenomenon that hadn't been seen before. Now, there's an intriguing bit uh, in a brief statement in an earlier time, back at the creation of Adam and Eve. And that goes like this. This is back in Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Um, it's a second account of creation. It's not really a second account, but it's a telling of the story from a particular, particular emphasising particular things. And it says there, Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, or land, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So it's indicating that everything's well watered, but there's actually no rain. God had not sent rain on the earth, and instead uh, streams came up. Now this word is a very unusual Hebrew word there, and it seems to be talking about um, upwellings of water or fountains perhaps, or something or other, water's coming up from below. It could also be mists. That's quite a valid translation of it. It's a rare word, but it could mean mists as well. But somehow or other, everything on the earth is being watered, but not with rain. It specifically says there was no rain. 
Okay. Now, um, on the basis of uh, these biblical quotations and, and geological evidence, of which I've very briefly touched on, Patton thinks that prior to the Earth, there was actually a huge canopy of water vapour over the surface of the Earth. There was a vastly more water vapour up there in the atmosphere uh, before the flood than there has been since. He also thinks there was much more carbon dioxide as well in the atmosphere. And what would be the effect? He's working out as a, as a geographer and a person interested in uh, climatology, he's trying to work out what would be the effect of such a canopy up there, besides the fact that it's watering everything on Earth without rain. Uh, what would be the effect? Um, such a canopy would result in the heat energy received from the sun being distributed far more evenly across the globe, uh, right to the polar regions. It would be a far more equable climate the whole way around. The high water content in the atmosphere would keep the temperature stay relatively, with far less range than we have from, from day to night as well. Um, and this in turn, uh, besides creating, you know, providing for all this luxuriant vegetation over the whole earth, um, it would also have another effect that it would drastically reduce air movement because it's all being heated quite evenly and the, the thing that drives our weather patterns today are, is uneven heating of the earth. Um, that's, it goes together. If the earth's heated evenly or relatively evenly, there's not the same air movement either horizontally or vertically. So the atmosphere would be very stable and the climate would be stable too. And what this means also is that the ozone, which is formed naturally by the sun's radiation and impinging on the outer edge of the atmosphere, the ozone would be formed in the upper levels of the atmosphere and the ozone would remain largely at that level and very little would come down to the surface of the earth. Ozone's great up there. You know, we all know about the uh, ozone layer and the, the fear about the hole in the ozone layer in modern times. But ozone is great up there because it protects and shields all life on Earth from the harmful ultraviolet and other radiation from the sun. So all the, all the ultraviolet radiation is blocked up there because of the ozone layer. There's, so there's not getting down here where it's doing all this damage, uh, aging everybody and everything and causing uh, uh, mu genetic mutations as well and so on, which have its effect generation by generation. It's not doing these things. And the ozone up there um, and the ozone's not down here, so there's no ozone doing all this dangerous, uh, all this deadly chemical uh, damage down here either. It's all, the ozone's all up there. And he goes on further that not only is this so, uh, it means, what it means is that life on Earth's surface, uh, things would be much more conducive to life down here on the Earth's surface than they are today. The combination of the water vapour canopy and the upper level ozone would have provided a very effective shield. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, but also the increased water vapour in the atmosphere, he says, would shield the ozone at the upper levels from long wave radiation back from the Earth surface, which is the agent apparently causing the ozone to revert to regular diatomic oxygen. I'm taking his word for that. So he thinks the ozone layer would be even thicker because of that, but all nicely stable up there at the top of the uh, atmosphere. Okay, now if I've got time, I'll, I'll go on with this another thing. Um, there's patterns. Uh, there's something intriguing that this is not from pattern. This is me, not from Paten. This is from me and my own research. There's some intriguing things uh, about Genesis itself. There are word patterns in the record about the six days of creation in chapter one. I think we'd all be aware of this, how the, at the end of every day it says there was evening, there was morning, the first day, the second day. So that's one pattern. And that's very, that's the most regular one. It goes all the way through. There's a few other patterns as well. And I've just quoted there Genesis 1, 3 to 5. So you can see the ones I've got, the words I've got highlighted are the patterns in relation to the first day. So the words, and God said, that's repeated throughout Genesis 1. The first day, God says something. And then the second day, God, God says, and God said, it uses the very same words uh, right through there. It's on each of the days, but twice on day three, because there are actually two parts of day three, and then three times on day six. So it does say every day, uh, and then because there's double aspects of creation on days three and day six, 
there's, there's patterns through all this, days one to three, days four to six. Um, and they, they, so it's three times there, for, and God said. The next bit, and it was so, or for day one, it's a slight variation of and there was, comes in English, but the Hebrew is very similar. And that's t also days one, two, three, twice on day three, day four, surprisingly not on day five, but on day six it's twice. So there's a pattern there with, with that, that set of words, with those Hebrew words. And then it says, and there was evening and morning uh, the first day and so on. That's, that's a consistent pattern all the way through. So, so far it's all neat, but there's another pattern and it's got two curious omissions. It's not explained it's why there's a mission, but it, it must, I think it must indicate something. It's, none of these things are just by chance. And that is the words, oh, where is it? God saw that whatever it was good. It says that every day. Day one, he does something rather, and he saw it was good. Day two, he does something rather, and so on. The two omissions are, first of all, on day two. On day two, that's when God separated the waters above the sky, the firmament from the waters below the sky. So he did, he said something, it was done, but it doesn't say God saw that it was good. Then he goes on and says that there was a second day, you know, the evening and morning. Why is that omitted? It could, is that somehow related to uh, the fact that God's work in that was actually not complete at the time of creation? There was something more re remaining to be done about the waters above and the waters below the firmament. Okay, well, we're gonna just keep that in mind. The second concerns the creation of human beings on day six. Remember how I said on day six that there's two parts of the creation. Day six, God made all these animals and he saw that, he said, oh, that's very good. Sorry, God saw that it was good. He saw it was good. And then he goes on to his most special creation, the creation of human beings and surprisingly, doesn't say God saw that it was good. Now, I think there's an indication there that God's purpose in creating human beings was not complete at that time. Does it anticipate the fall and the need for redemption and all of human history, all of you know, salvation history, um, which is not complete yet until God redeems human beings, brings them to finally to where they were intended to be, intended to be then it would be really, it will be good. Finally, it's not explained, and nowhere else in the Bible is this explained, so I'm just pointing out to you these two strange omissions from the, all these patterns in Genesis 1, which is otherwise, uh, well, it is nonetheless a very beautiful presentation of creation, quite poetic in many ways. The fact that it's poetic doesn't mean it's not historical, by the way. It's just uh, there's reasons to put it as poetry. Um, now, what is... Let's, let's go and let's look now at the record of the flood itself in Genesis 6 to 9 and what we can learn from that as to how the flood happened. So here we have, uh, I've written, recorded here. It says in Genesis chapter 7 verses 11 to 12, this is after Noah's made the ark and all the animals have gone into it. And this is when the, the flood's right starting. All the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so it mentions rain, but it mentions two other things. These springs of the great deep and the floodgates of heavens, which were in action also for the 40 days, and then it came to an end. Now, what are these springs of the great deep? It sounds like welling up from the ocean and subterranean waters and everything. And what are the floodgates of heavens? Maybe this relates to the extraordinary amount of water vapour that's up there. It's, it doesn't seem to be talking about normal clouds and normal rain. Nonetheless, rain is mentioned. When you go through the, uh, the, the whole record there, uh, as I did, I found that rain is mentioned in three specific times and twice of those, two times, in association with these things here, which the springs of the great deep and the floodgates of the heavens but it's separate from them. The rain fell, the springs burst forth, and the floodgates were opened, it says, all for 40 days. What are these floodgates of heaven? They seem to be something other than just rain. And on the other hand, floodwaters, flood and waters are mentioned over 14 times through that record. 
So rain's only mentioned three times. There was rain, but Patton, um, along with others, uh, thinks that there's something a lot more than just regular rain that's involved in all this. Okay. Um, now another matter too, another... Um, it's far more than a normal storm event. And one reason, another reason, is that the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Here's a picture of Mount Ararat. There's actually a twin peak there. And the highest of the, these is actually over 5,000 metres above sea level. And the, other, the second one's pretty close. And this whole region, a vast region all around it, is all very elevated. Uh, it's typically over 3,000 metres above sea level. So whether, we don't know exactly where the ark uh, came to rest, somewhere up there, and uh, I won't go into all the expeditions that have been there to try and find it and the inconclusive results they've come to. But anyway, so, but it's very high up. So how come the ark ended up there? If it was a device that was just going to float and, you know, the rain came down, floods, you'd expect it to drift down uh, to sea level somewhere, so it would, would have ended up you know, somewhere in the Arabian Gulf or something like that, um, you would have thought. But it ended up snagged up on the mountains of Ararat. Okay? Um, that's rather odd. Now Patton uh, thinks that there was a near approach of a heavenly body to the, earth and, to the earth and that caused this catastrophe. He then reviews data of other planets in our solar system, and I haven't got time to present all this here. Uh, there's a great deal of interesting information about all the other planets, including the direction of rotation, the, act, the angle of the axis, and so on. But the particular thing he focuses on is um, uh, about ice, ice in space. I didn't know this until recently, but apparently there's a great deal of ice up there uh, outside of the Earth, uh, water ice. Um, he reviews the planets uh, and the moon, their moons. Some moons may be comprised largely or wholly of ice. Not our moon, but other moons. He gives information about the three rings of Saturn and discusses how they may have come about. How it's a disintegration of some body and there's actually three separate rings of Saturn. And perhaps, he says, this gives us a clue as to what, well, something that might have happened that's akin to what happened on Earth. Saturn's rings are actually made up of billions of particles raising from, ranging in size from grains of sand to mountain-sized chunks and it's composed predominantly of water ice, I'm told, and the temperature of this ice is less than minus 150 degrees centigrade. Absolutely freezing ice and a lot of it up there. According to Patton, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, the four major planets of our solar system, are composed of much ice. Some astronomers apparently say it's mostly ices and hydrogen. And he lists various moons. Oh, look, I'll have to just skip this. Um, but there's a lot of ice up there, ice and rock, but plenty of ice. Supercooled ice, so it turns out, is a very abundant substance in our solar system. There you go. Patton proposes a model for the flood event. He th reckons there was a significantly large heavenly body, perhaps having a mass like that of Mercury, a planet with a solid core and a substantial ice cover that came close to the Earth and orbited it for a short time before escaping Earth's gravitational field, maybe after a period of four to five months. And this would have caused phenomenal tidal forces on Earth, resulting in catastrophic ocean tides and also magma tides that he's mentioned earlier, lifting up mountain ranges. Now I haven't yet digested all the information that Patton puts forward there in relation to mountains, but he looks at the location uh, of mountains on the earth, significant mountain ranges, and a great many of them are actually in two great arcs. There's the one down through the Americas, and there's another one going through uh, the uh, uh, through the, the Himalayas and the, and the Alps. Now, um, I, I, I'm not able to present all this, but he reckons, looking at where the centres of various arcs are, that it correlates to a line, two lines, two major lines going around the Earth. Anyway, I haven't had time or the ability yet to digest all that, but he reckons that these, the mountain ranges, most of them on the Earth, fit the model he's presenting for the flood. 
And at a critical point in the approach of this planet to the Earth, when it gets close enough, the ice was stripped off this planet and disintegrated, and due to its being electrically charged and the Earth's gravitational field, it fell predominantly and suddenly over the magnetic poles. It didn't just fall generally on the Earth, but it fell on the poles. It's all mixed up with what's happening uh, to the atmosphere and these tides and everything. And at the same time, the Earth's vapour canopy collapsed. In an event like that, like he imagines, it would be a miracle if any living thing survived what would have happened to the Earth. And that's exactly what it was. It was a miracle. You know, it's no ordinary boat. It's no that's <coughs> involved in all this. The Earth would be radically changed, including its atmosphere and climate. Now let's look again at the Bible. Um, I've got some more Bible texts. Uh, there's a few things I want to bring out here. The little indications that tell us that things were radically different before the flood. And all the indications are consistent. They're all pointing in one direction. They're not here and there, they're together. Now it says uh, at the time of Noah, Genesis 6 verse 3, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. This is before the flood and also afterwards. Now Nephilim, that word literally means fallen ones in Hebrew. It's a very rare word. And in its context, we're not told anything about these Nephilim. They do seem to be associated with the violence that was filling the earth and the evil that was going on, but that's all. However, later on, uh, the, the only other place in the Bible uh, we read the same word Nephilim, it's much later when they're coming into, uh, the Israelites are coming into the Promised Land. And the men who were the spies, they went out there and had a look and they said, we can't attack those people, they are stronger than we are. They said, all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Now, not all the people they encountered were like this when they spied the land, but some were. They, somehow they're gigantic people, very strong and large. Now, we know from, um, from geological evidence too that um, uh, we, we know from fossil remains that there were many other giant creatures in ancient times, like the woolly mammoths that I've mentioned that are no longer on the earth. Um, but also the di all the dinosaurs, a whole range of dinosaurs, huge creatures that no longer exist. And there was, even in Australia, there was megafauna, which is now extinct. It seems that the environment long ago was much more favourable to life than it is now, and that in some areas it produced these large, much larger than normal creatures. Okay, now there's one other passage which I haven't listed up here, what but it's in. Yeah, oh, look, I, I can't uh, tell you where that's. <laughs> I found that on the internet. <laughs> I... <laughs> so it must be true, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't really know what that is, but I thought, oh, this is going to illustrate the point. So no, I don't really think that... Uh, not a factual I, I don't think it's factual. To no. Me. It's OK. I think that would be sensational. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. OK, um, so we cover the Nephilim. Uh, now, another matter is in Genesis 8, verse 1, when the, uh, the ark's up there, and it says, God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. It took a long time for the waters to go down and before Noah came out. But you notice how it says God sent a wind. Now this is actually the first reference in the Bible to a wind. The Hebrew word is ruach and it can be variously translated spirit, breath or wind. You can see how those things are all related. Um, but, um, but you have to take note of the context to understand what is, which is the proper trans English translation. Okay? So the translators have done that. It's not actually the first time that Ruach appears in the Bible when it talked about, um, where it, the, back in Genesis 1 verse 2, the Spirit of God hovered on the face of the waters in the time of the chaos before creation. That word spirit there is ruach as well. And so there are several instances of the word appearing, but never as the, in the sense of wind until this point. And then elsewhere in the Bible, there's you know, many references to ruach. It's a common enough word. 
and it often does mean wind um, elsewhere. But this is the first occasion. Now, does this mean that there wasn't ever any wind beforehand? It's sort of an indication. Uh, was it, is this coincident with the Earth's climate regime changing and suddenly now there's patterns of winds which weren't there before? Possibly. You know, all these things, like you can't say there's this is definitely so, I can't be dogmatic about these things, but there's indications. See how they all are consistent? Now there's also one more peculiar incident about Noah, and perhaps in view of the time I'll skip that, but um, it might come up in discussion. Noah, a very righteous man, the man that God was favoured in the sight of God and whom God decided with his family to save, got drunk. Now, you wonder, well, how did that happen? Is that just a moral stumbling of someone who's otherwise a very good person? The Bible never hides moral failures of even its most greatest heroes, like David in the Old Testament or Peter in the New Testament. But perhaps it's a lapse on Noah's part, uh, the, out, of his, out of character. Perhaps there's something else in it. Perhaps because of changes, I mean, surely they had vines beforehand, before the flood, and surely they pressed them and made grape juice. But something is different after the flood. Anyway, I'll just leave that there. Now, the most important thing, and this is the thing that we finally need to, need to get to, is that the Bible record about the flood, um, which is a bit different from, there's, there's flood records all around the world in all these ancient cultures and everything, and there's more, there's certain consistencies with them and certain differences amongst them all. And that's another whole story, so, which I won't touch on tonight. But the Bible, presents the flood as definitely no accident. It didn't just happen, it was sent by God. It was arranged by God for a particular reason. And this is most important. The Bible records that God brought the flood to pass as a judgment on all mankind at the time. It was no accident. It was entirely in the will of God. It was his response to the moral state of mankind generally. And that's made very clear in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 12, before God brings the flood. It tells how God saw great wickedness almost universally on the earth. There was, there was evil all the time. Everybody only ever thought of evil things and did evil things. It says that the earth was corrupt and full of violence. It said that all the people just about Noah only accepted, but all the people on earth had corrupted their ways, so much so that the Lord was grieved and his heart was filled with pain, and that's why he sent the flood. God arranged it all. Now, this is very significant uh, as to the fact that the Bible presentation of this is that it was a judgment on the earth. Now, if these people lived such a vastly long age, it might make us understand why the earth got to be in that state. It's consistent, there's a consistency here. And sadly, uh, this, this fact uh, about, because it looks like the earth was much more conducive to life, the earth was very fruitful, it might have been a lovely place. If we don't know what level of technology or standard of living they had, it may have been a lot higher than we would guess um, back then. But in any case, it does sound like uh, life was pretty good and these people lived a mighty long age and they didn't need to think about God. You know, it was, God was far from their thoughts and uh, so they became very corrupt. Sadly, this too, the degradation of human life warranting God's judgment is consistent with other features of the story that we've considered. In such an environment, far from being thankful to God and worshipping him for all that he'd given to them, Human beings turn from him and descend into every form of depravity. And this, sadly, is consistent with the rest of the Bible. It's the, it's the prosperity so often results in a falling away from God, eventually incurring his judgment. It's the cycle of the book of Judges. The people prospered, they forgot God, and they dilly-dallied in this, that, and every other abominable thing. So God sent some other group on them to punish them and then in their extremity and when they were oppressed and everything, they cried out to God, please, please send us a deliverer. And God has mercy on them, sends a deliverer. They throw off the enemies, they recover, they prosper again. And the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. That's the story of the 
Judges. But it's not only the story of Judges, it's the whole story of Israel too. Uh, all the um, Old Testament records about them, they went constantly through this kind of cycle and very often they fell away when they prospered. Um, and it's also, I believe, what is happening in modern times in our Western world. Things have never been so good. Technology is increasing astronomically, health technology too, and uh, we've got so many pleasures and wonderful things, all of which are wonderful in themselves. And what happens? People fall away from God. And uh, we see this right through the Western world in particular. So now we come to the point of all this. The Bible account of the flood is consistent within itself. It's consistent with the rest of the Bible. It's consistent with geological evidence, only a tiny bit that I've presented, but it is consistent. It's consistent with astro astronomical data that we can gather. Um, the, the, the record may make sense. And it's consistent with science generally. Far from being uh, the stuff of um, fairy tales and legends, there's a consistency with all these things and it stands up. The Bible record is credible, even the exceedingly long lifespan of Methuselah. And there's no reason, or no good reason, to treat it other than as history, which is what it purports to be. That history which flows on to the history and the rest of the Bible. The other thing to our battle this is that God is in control. He always has been and he always will be. He can judge, he has judged, and he will judge. And we need to fear him. What he did, he can do again. Not in exactly the same way he said he would never bring a flood, but we need to fear God. And this is what the Apostle Peter wrote towards the end of the New Testament. This is one of the lessons that he draws out of the record about the flood. And then I'll, I'll conclude with this. By these waters, and he's talking about the flood of Noah's time, by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, that is, the word of God, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So uh, there's an appeal in all that. There's, there's a considerable warning from the Apostle Peter that should come to us all, should resonate with us all, and we should think seriously about what we've read about the flood back there in Noah's day and what it, uh, what it points to as to what God can and may and will do in, in the future and what we need to, uh, what, how we need to respond to that. So the ultimate conclusion is that we really need to read the Bible and to read it very carefully and with respect. It really matters. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much. I'll start off with a question. Exert my right privilege of power. Um, these events are, like, are supposedly written hundreds or a thousand years mm. Uh, were, were recorded supposedly in Genesis uh, about a thousand years after the events occurred. What do you think was kind of uh, like, how would the writer have known um, about the historicity of these events? Well, what was, what was what, if you were the writer sitting there, uh, like uh, traditionally um, uh, the first five books were written by Moses, mm -hmm. and um, other people believe uh, written later. Like, um, how would they know? Do you, uh, mm -hmm. How would that history be maintained orally, mm -hmm. or in written form, or otherwise? Um, if if not, would God kind of zap that knowledge onto the writer, mm -hmm. so that they are actually recording true history? What What do you think was the mode of writing? Um, well, first of all, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy, known as the Pentateuch, uh, Pentameaning five, uh, attributed to Moses. And, uh, and uh, there's a little tiny bit that obviously Moses didn't write. He couldn't have written the bit about his death, for example. But uh, very largely, um, it's thought that he wrote those books. However, especially for the book of Genesis, which was before the time of Moses, 
from Exodus onwards, it's really the history of uh, Moses' birth and then what happened um, from there. In, in Genesis, it does appear that Moses not so much wrote Genesis as compiled Genesis. Compiler would be a better term because there's a number, there's about 12 parts through Genesis. Genesis, if you look carefully at the way it's structured, there's a number of different parts and they, you know, I refer to patterns in Genesis 1. Well, there's, pattern, there's a pattern in Genesis as well. Um, and there's a, there's a Hebrew term called toledoth, uh, which means generations. For, and, it, and it says the, this is the generation, uh, this is the generation of the record of the generations of so and so. Uh, and so the, these various narratives through the book of Genesis, there's about 12 of them. And um, so it would appear to me that they actually came from a much earlier age and that Moses just took, the, took these together. So they were extant in Moses' day. Uh, when you look at the ages of people too, and if, if, no, if there are no records, no generations missing, let's assume that there's not. But because of the very long ages that they lived, um, you're not far from people who were actually in those events. So, for example, Shem, uh, the son of Noah, um, lived through the flood. He was about 100, I think he was 100 years old when uh, it looks like he was about 100 when the flood came. And I think he lived, from memory, 600 years altogether. So he was alive for 500 years after the flood. So then you go down through the generations, you find out, well, who was born and overlapped with, with, uh, with uh, Shem, who could have recounted all that happened about the flood, um, and by the way, all these ancient peoples, um, if they didn't have writing, and especially if they didn't have writing, they were excellent at oral transmission of information. Um, and this has been found from modern times too, with tribes even like Aboriginal people of Australia, but elsewhere as well. Especially where there's no written form, the oral tradition is very strong and stays reliable over generations. But in actual fact, you don't have many people, you don't need transmission between many people until you get to the time of Moses, you really don't. So it's not as though it's got to have come down like Chinese whispers through, you know, 100, 100 people and so therefore it's going to get garbled, even if it was oral. Um, it didn't need, didn't need many people. So what you're trying to say is that Abraham was a bit over 100 years old when Shem died? Um, I can't remember that. I can't remember the exact data, but Shem, is that right? Say again. Abraham. Abraham would have been a bit over a hundred years old when Shem died. Is that right? Well, isn't that amazing? If, uh, that so he that means Abraham could have himself got information directly from Shem. So there's there's ten generations there. Uh, Shem was the eleventh, wasn't he? And uh, Abraham was the twentieth, according to the record. So there you go. Um, and if he's a godly man and wants to know what really what really happened, he could have talked to his ancestor, his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Shem. I think it's fair to say that the first big civilization, hosted by the Sum Sumerian, had got writing stuff. It was horrible. The writing was pretty early. Was the writing, so we did have records, play tablets, yep. that date back certainly more than 2000 years BC. Yep. Uh, and some, I think, I just had to look up here, there's a friend of mine called Wilson, I think it was, that, um, uh, a guy who was an archaeologist in the Middle East, um, who's uh, has written in this book that the town of Eric, Eric, which is one of the yep, first few found in right. Genesis chapter 10, has records of people of very long ages, yep. and then after a flood of short duration. So the Bible's not That's the right. only one. That's quite that true. Has a record yeah. of very long age people, a yeah. flood, and then much shorter, well, yeah. a, descent, a, a decreasing age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were the kings, that they were actually talking about kings, but that's what they. That's correct. And the interesting point is those ages were around about 20,000 years. Somewhere about long, So yeah. people who think the Bible is uh, fabulously legendary with these long ages, yeah. um, they're actually very conservative compared to what other people claim. That's quite true too. Yeah, I didn't have time to bring in all that information. It is in um, some of Velikovsky's writings, and I think Patton does some of that too as well. Um, there's an awful lot can be considered with all this. Um, I, I do think too that we have a tendency to denigrate the past and um, all the way through and think that 
you know, we talk about the Dark Ages as well in, um, in medieval times, and um, we don't know what the level of the civilization was back there in, in Noah's day and before, and it may well have been far more advanced than, uh, than we imagine. The human spirit's always been the same, the drive to um, and make improvements and to discover things and make things. and uh, So it may have been much more advanced than we imagine. There's no, no evidence for it. It's all, it's all gone. But well, even post-flood, the pyramids. Even post-flood. The, the pyramids, uh, I've read about the pyramids that uh, until modern times, it would be pretty difficult for people to make the pyramids as they were. The, the accuracy with which they've they'd been made and the huge blocks and the organisation of people it's really something, and the alignment of them, and uh, so on. And then, yeah, they were made, um, you know, two thousand. Some of them were two thousand BC. Um, they could have bore holes and stuff like that as well. They could bore holes. They've got bore, bore holes through the rocks. Have they? Have yeah. So there's some astounding things, and um, we too easily just write them all off as being, you know, absolute primitives, and um, you know, and would believe anything too. Uh, it's not like that. I don't think it was not like that. On the oral tradition, I just um, 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 have some doubts mm. on that uh, from the point of view that if you consider the book of Hebrews, um, in the second century, the early church fathers, when it came to the crunch, they had no idea who wrote it. Uh, that information yeah. had been lost. Mm. It wasn't retained. I think that's yeah, actually so very good evidence to believe their claims for other books of the Bible. So when they had this one they weren't sure about, they clearly and honestly admitted right. we don't know. So yeah. other ones where they claim we do know, that's good reason to believe that they did. But that, that's a hundred years and that information yeah. was lost. Well, there's a lot of things that uh, later writers, uh, Christian leading writers, um, um, speculated about. Oh, I can't just think of things now, but... Uh, that they didn't, you know, not everything had been transferred down orally, but I guess important things had. Um, I know that, you know, all the writings of the New Testament, for example, there's no names on any of them. Oh, oh Paul, Paul, some of Paul's writings, sorry, there are. Yeah, yeah but yeah, the Gospels, there's no names on the Gospels, no, no. for example. Um, but may I say that we believe Moses grew up in the Egyptian court, raised yeah. probably in the greatest libraries um, yeah. of that era, yeah. maybe in Mesopotamia might have equal ones, but certainly he would have gained as much knowledge as the accumulated wisdom of the Egyptians. Yeah, all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. also, like, how were the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob retained? And uh, it may have been that Joseph yeah. uh, right. ordered some records yeah. to be made. Because if we're looking before Abraham, then yes, uh, that. Uh, that's where I think Egyptian records might have had quite a bit more play as opposed to mm. perhaps the mm. record post Abraham, but certainly Joseph before him. I think, you know, um, I mean, I, I have an extremely high regard for the Bible as literature, even. And the, the literary features of, um, of Genesis, for example, are of a very high order. You know, the way various stories are told. We do have to make an effort to get into the culture of the times. Uh, it's so far away from our experience. Um, and so there's a lot of things that puzzle us, but the literary um, characteristics of the writing of, uh, of um, Genesis and other parts is, is of a high quality. And, um, and the way it all hangs together, the consistency of things, um, in many, many regards, um, I think is um, wonderful too. I found what you um, pointed out about the negative exponential. Yeah. Um, like, that wouldn't have been in their mathematics at the no, time, would no, it? No, no, uh, And yet it kind of fits um, um, a natural formula yeah. that's kind of been now discovered now. in modern times, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're just simply recording, just like a registry of birth, deaths and marriages. They're and just simply so recording, this fellow died him, and this fellow and his son died then, and his, mm. you know... And, and it follows a negative It happens to yeah. come out like that. Um, it's anything like the DNA, it seems like we carry all those information in, within us. Mm. So is there anything like the, um, the evidence, like we 
our body was capable of living thousand years. In, yeah. In that sort of well, I'm not. Um, like I'm not a biologist, right? and I, I know I have a smattering of uh, knowledge of uh, bio, biological sciences, but I'm an engineer, and, uh, and no, um, just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I do understand um, some some things. Some things from modern medical knowledge about what causes aging in human beings, and so there's more and more attention being given to this, and uh, and how how bad ultraviolet light is for us and another rays of high energy rays uh, and that they actually are not only damaging to uh, skin tissue and human tissue, living tissue, but they're actually damaging genetically as well. And this is where I wish I knew more, but they actually cause, I understand, they cause mutations. And if you didn't have that ultraviolet light, for example, um, presumably the rate of mutations would be far less than they are now and as well as that, the rate of uh, damage uh, of skin and other tissue would be far, far less. So I can only imagine that, um, I wish I knew more about all this, but I can only imagine that that would mean that you would live much longer and you wouldn't be, have to be anxious about skin cancer or other cancers and you'd be, uh, and possibly it affects the bacterial world as well. So maybe you wouldn't be a, a so affected by various infections, and I don't know. I, I really don't know. But, but is there any evidence from the past that people live long ages then? Because I, I thought. It, um, well, the Bible's evidence. Uh, yeah. But in terms of people digging up bones and bodies and things like that, all the ones that they go have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, certainly Good through. Good point. But um, yeah, <laughs> but um, life's uh, been but pretty short for a long time uh, until yeah. modern times. Sorry. Life has been pretty short yes. for people uh, since yes. the time of Christ, say, um, you know, yes. or wherever, wherever, wherever in the world. They've dug up people from um, uh, way back. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence from that that um, was life shorter or longer from the, uh, what they've dug up? Well, I don't think you can dig up bones from uh, the time of Noah. That's the, that's the well, problem. Even, no. These people buried in uh, Egypt, you know, I mean, how, yeah. how, how, the age of those people. Well, yeah. I, I, I imagine they're about the age that we're familiar with, aren't they? They would have died, this pharaoh died at this age, and that pharaoh died. It's not extraordinary at all. But that's all post flood. They were very incestuous, so that caused uh, longevity of Tuesday. Yeah. Well, interestingly, yes, the prohibition of uh, near relative marriage only comes in in the yeah. law of Moses, which is yeah. down about uh, in the 1400 BC. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but that's also. You say something? That's not point. It's another point. Right. Yeah, just just to complete that, um, I, I I do think that a lot of things in the law of Moses were codifying what was already there. But, but I do know. Abraham yeah, before they did. I oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the Egyptians common. would often marry their sisters or yeah, yeah. the pharaohs. Can I say something on that point? Um, I, I had a quick look before and. Um, uh, I searched the longest living animals, and um, most of the long living animals are all from within deep down in the sea where there's no ultraviolet light. I guess so that would okay. be something that I would I would make a comment on. Right. Uh, I mean, animals like clams, live longest clams to today. About, uh, yes, yes, oh, okay. that's right. So there's right. a clam that died, I think, quite recently, and it was 450 something years old. Wow! And the fish. How do they know that? Uh, I'm not sure about the First clam, but they said that the fish, they looked at the growth rings on its scale. That's they right. got a scale from the growth, and they got the growth rings out of it, oh, and it wow. was 300 or 400 something years old. Wow, that's um, interesting. And, Is that um, the koi fish? fish? Sorry? Is that the koi fish? I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. there's a very old fish. about some of the fish in the Murray-Darling system, the, some of the cod were. Mm -hmm. 100 or 120 mm -hmm. years old. Yeah. How do they know that? Yeah. There's that from scales as well. I, I didn't ask the question, but they said the, yeah. the fish were over 120 mm. years old. Yeah, yeah, but, but they say jellyfish yeah. are effectively immortal. They can they can basically mm. regenerate their cells with their body to an earlier, okay. basically yeah. to a youthful body. Turtles. Turtles. Turtles, and turtles yeah, a long time. Yeah, turtles, mm. another thing which... Uh, so there's a couple of animals that were 200, 250 years old. Mm. And Tortoise are also old, and I wonder if that's so because low of their metabolic thick, rate. Their, mm. Yeah, but I wonder if it's also because of their thick shell mm. that can protect them from a lot of the damaging mm. rays or whatever. If it's, See, maybe the dinosaurs 
died out because something, like you're saying, dramatically changed. Mm. So dinosaurs took a longer to actually grow, and they didn't have the ability to grow that. So they basically mm. died out because something happened yeah, within the atmosphere. Yeah, they lived in a very different age. world. Did, can you can you tell from dinosaur bones how long they might have lived? Uh, I don't know. Have to ask Andrew Crandall. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't I know. I think reptiles keep growing, so. Looking at the size, yeah. might have some indication. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Anyway, I thought that was interesting that there's still yeah. there's yeah. animals or living organisms today that live for close to the ages that you're talking about. Wow. But most of, them are, most of them are in the water. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I just like to make a comment about one of the implications of this picture that's been painted of a very mild, moderate, moist, favourable to life world. Um, quite you know, without wind and without rain and very moist, um, is that there's no, it, it, it excludes two things. It excludes deserts, arid zones, and it excludes polar regions. And what was the second thing, sorry? Polar regions. No, the second arid zones. Arid zones. Arid zones. Aridity. Like, right. Yeah. Deserts and oh, so, okay. oh, so that was elaborated. If you look at the deserts. world today, you'll find whole suites, you know, thousands of animals of species which are adapted to arid zone, that yes. different in form. They actually have quite different physiologies to concentrate the urine and to cope with the water yes, stress, yeah. etc. Yeah. And the implication from this picture is that God didn't do a second, there's no record of a second creation, so that these things must have evolved from very similar yeah. or from similar life forms. So it basically, it, this picture requires evolution and adaptation to mm -hmm. a different adaptation. world. Adaptation. Through, and we have the mechanism, we have this evolutionary mechanism which can explain and account for that. No, mm. we don't see the DNA changing. What we see is subspecies thriving and others... Uh, look, sorry, we do. There are every species that has quite significant change... All the changes are related... are, are changes in DNA. So you can't say you don't see the DNA changing. That's not, that's not true. The DNA yeah. is different and, ex and explains the differences. Mm. But but I think you're really sort of drawing too much there um, because um, I don't know, you know, there's no record that there weren't deserts or polar regions before the flood. We have such limited uh, data to go on in the Bible. Well, what I was keen to point out was that the few indications we have are all consistent with one another and they're all pointing in one direction. It doesn't tell us that there weren't any deserts and there weren't any polar regions, but it does look like um, things in many ways were more favourable to life over mo most of the Earth's surface. And that, that accords with geological evidence today as well. Um, all over the Earth, there's evidence of uh, temperate subtropical uh, vegetation right up into polar regions and, and no, everywhere. I'm not, and I'm not deserts, yeah. with that evidence yeah. in the fossil So record. I don't know that there were, I, I don't know, and the Bible doesn't say that there weren't any deserts and desert creatures. Um, I, you know, my understanding is that things uh, can change in time within the species, or, or strictly within the kinds. The Bible talks about kinds, and so there's discussion as to well, how much, how does that correlate with modern day species, which are much more strictly defined. But I do believe that there is variation within the within kinds, and we do that deliberately with our breeding, um, with human interference, and I do think it happens naturally as well, um, just through de 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 geographical regions and entering into different environments. <coughs> There's a lot of books in this world that are written where they're expressing lots of different ideas, mm -hmm. so you can actually kind of choose which books you want to truth. read mm. because of what you want to believe. Mm. And so you can be a cherry pick. And so if you want to believe such mm. and such, then mm. choose a certain category of books, mm. study them up, and become convinced about that. How did you actually choose the set of books that you read? <laughs> um, the book that came to me, um, this pattern book, was one I inherited from my father. My father had a, quite a library. <laughs> um, well, I wasn't made to read it. <laughs> But I was very, quite taken with uh, these thoughts of uh, astronomical things affecting the Earth. I don't know. Um, we're all we all um, get to different books in different ways, don't we? And uh, well, I think I see. We physically see the impact craters of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. We had a huge comet crash the Earth. I don't think anyone could deny that. Sorry, you, you, 
just off Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, there is a huge crater where a big comet or meteor yeah. really crashed into the Earth. And there's various other you know, impact craters and meteors around. So I don't think anyone can now say there wasn't catastrophic events on Earth. We know there are, because we have two. Sorry, we had a different question on how do you choose yeah. his books? No, I, I agree. But I'm back mm. to the point, um, inferring that he was, and this is about this particular author was saying, we are not, we do no longer believe the uniformism. Mm. Remember Sir Charles Lyle back 200 yeah. years ago said, oh, he looked at Scotland and said, ah, we've got all this very gradual erosion. That's all I can see. That's how the world must ever have been. I'm sorry. And that's, Darwin read his book and went off and said, oh, yeah, that's, that's how it was. I'm sorry. He was blatantly wrong because he could have just a short distance away and seen massive evidence of quite dramatic changes. Well, I think there's evidence everywhere in the world for catastrophism, really. Yeah. Um, um, you know, you look at look at the strata of so many um, places. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, how do I choose books? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I have some certain books are recommended to me. Um, I do I do like to read things that, in some way or other, are going to help me uh, understand or the Bible better. Um, so the Bible is foundational to me. Um, and uh, people recommend things. So I did inherit that one from my father. That other book I referred to, the one by Nelson, was one I was given 40, on my 21st birthday, over 45 years ago, it sat on my shelf for 45 years, I've only just read it. <laughs> so, so fortunately the people still alive, I thank them for the book. Um, and that was quite interesting, a review of how all the geological evidence has been considered over the years, and quite um, carefully, um, up, and, up until then modern times, how it's changed. and what. Uh, and how people were taking into account new discoveries of things until the time of Darwin, and then it was a radical change uh, in adopting this view of uniformitarianism. You know that well, everything's just changed gradually, 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 and uh, things have been going on. What, what you see today is how things have been going on for, for ages, and I just don't think that that stacks up. I really don't. But that's not a current a current picture. I mean. Every biologist will, will basically acknowledge that there was a big catastrophe that caused the massive extinction, not just yeah. of dinosaurs, but at the end of that Cretaceous. And the, the, the currently accepted view now is a, it was a um, giant impact meteor that, that probably yeah. brought it about. Um, so there's certainly an embracing of yeah. um, catastrophism. Yeah, now. Look, at, look at the moon, but look at the craters on the moon. We have progressed and, and science it looks at that. But the, the other thing that I would say is that. There's also been a, a huge, um, since the time these books that we've heard about tonight were written, a huge understanding and development of very, very specific evidence in terms of the whole mechanism and continental drift and ocean floor spread and the uh, polar reversals which leave banded patterns across all the ocean floors which can be dated in this incredible pattern. You only have to look at a map on, on Google Earth to see these, these, these fracture lines and the whole, we didn't know about um, continental drift um, and now there's a whole understanding of how it's actually contributed to the development separation of continents, spread of oceans the formation and the impact zones of mountain ranges and the thrusts involved none of this is sort of was understood at the time and we do actually need to keep up yeah. and actually look at the scientific evidence and engage with it. Yeah I agree, I agree I admit that the books I've had were published quite a while ago, uh, the books I've had access to and uh, for one reason or another wanted to read and I'm not adverse to looking at all the, the current stuff either, at all, but uh, I, I don't know that there's a definitive uh, answers to, uh, from well, the modern things either. Hey, one thing I can mention too, um, often people talk about dating and carbon-14 dating, and this view of how the Earth changed at the time of Noah does also impact dating at least by carbon-14 methods. Because carbon-14 dating relies on the assumption that the level of uh, the proportion of carbon-14 to carbon has always been constant, and in modern times, I think it has. So when you can take when you take an object um, that and and date it, that you can you can verify by other historical methods, you find a pretty close correlation between something that was purported to be a thousand years ago. You, you get a date of a thousand years ago from carbon-14 dating. And you can look at historical records and find, yes, well, that object was 
so that thing was alive 14,000 years ago. Yeah, that, that's fine. But when you go back longer than that, into longer periods, suddenly you find carbon-14 dating gives you answers of uh, 6 million years and uh, 20 no, million no, years no, and no, stuff no, like no. that. It doesn't work at that scale. It only works at no. 4 or 5,000 years. Oh, no, 8, no 8, 10, 50,000 50, 50, on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's well, even, even that, even that, it's relying on an assumption that carbon-14 has always been the same. Now, if the atmosphere is very stable, carbon-14, I understand, is formed uh, by... Uh, impacting nitrogen, uh, which is you know the, the major gas in the atmosphere, and it's caught, it's formed in the upper atmosphere, and it filters down through the Earth. Now, I, I understand, my thinking is that if the Earth atmosphere is very different back then and stable, then you wouldn't have the same level of carbon-14 down here on Earth as uh, as there is now. So it means that you're starting with a very low level of carbon-14. Uh, a very low proportion of carbon-14 in any carbon-based material, uh, so that when you come to look at it later on, when it's been buried, and then you come and look at it, think, oh, this thing's you know 500,000 years old. Uh, I, um, I thought carbon-14 dating went back a lot more than no, that. No, it doesn't. The radiometric dating goes back further. Yeah. Carbon-14 goes back. It was about 14,000 years in this year. That's well, that's its half-life, isn't it? Okay. Uh, what's the half-life of... Um Carbon-14 is it's pretty long. It's, it's no, it's about... about no, it's only a few thousand years. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, thing is, it is actually right. a very minute magnitude, so even if it, it yeah, is yeah. a very small amount, fraction yeah. of the total of carbon that's yeah. out there. So it, it's such a, a small amount to measure, but that's what makes it difficult to go back. OK, I might have figures wrong here, but I think that um, such an atmospheric change may impact the... Um, the, uh, the the um, what you can, how you can use carbon fourteen dating for anything older than the flood. Uh, just, just a question. Yep. Uh, the hypothesis that UV light shortened lifespans. Uh, I thought UV, in a way, is necessary for vitamin D production. Of what you're saying that um, uh, UV lights necessary. UV lights ne necessary. necessary. UV, yeah. I mean, vitamin D production. Hel helpful in some ways. Yes. Mm. So okay. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and there is an issue with even some Australians not getting enough light. Exactly. Yeah. There is now. Mm. We, we slip slap and slop so much we no longer get enough. Particularly people. So wearing, must have been a real Particularly people back wearing burkas. When there was this really thick cloud of water vapor. Mm. And oh, also. Yeah. Well, yes and no. Um, if, if, if in those days they did, weren't slip slapping and swapping, they just walked around. Mm. But, ah, just with fig leaves. Well, maybe well that's, an interesting, fig. that's an interesting issue. Um, yeah, but so I don't know the answer. But of itself have necessarily taken all out. You know, if you no. put a hat on, that's far more. And there's another question I had with the ozone hypothesis. Um, uh, I, I can't quite remember because it was a uh, sign I did in high school. But the bad ozone, the ozone down uh, near Earth, yeah. I thought most of it's man-made. It's made from, I think it's electrical discharge or something. Electrical views. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I would doubt that, that ozone is the cause of the decrease in lifespans is it, uh, there should be a noticeable change in the lifespans with the invention of electricity, I would, I would assume. Well, I would guess is largely due to the um, the uh, cosmic rays hitting into the whatever I think it's the oxygen it's in the upper ionosphere. Yeah. I did my, my background is upper atmosphere physics yeah. and it is the I it's the cosmic it's, rays it's hitting formed up there oxygen yeah. Yeah. Uh, turning uh, O2 twos into threes. Yeah. And, uh, well, one. I'm saying the one down here, the bad one, not, not the good one. Yeah, you're right. It may well be due to electrical. Stuff and we've had a hundred years about that. At this point, Jeffrey and I have to go into denial because we are electrical engineers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would assume How could you dare <laughs> blame I would assume that would be minimal, relatively speaking, unless you're close enough to get a significant concentration at a specific location in time with the space. Um, other than that, the ozone would very quickly dissipate anyway. Um, so we would Because ozone's a poison, isn't it? But is it is it's, it's very toxic yeah. uh, to. Yeah. Yeah, down at this level, it very quickly turns back into O2. Yeah. Up there, it's very good because it shields us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this yeah. is in the last band. And the question with the water canopy, um, from my understanding, 
the literature on it, as they used to. It, it was uh, the, the hypothesis in favour of the early Croatians, and then because of um, not, a, not enough water density to count for the flood waters, they abandoned it. But with the astral hypothesis, um, would you still need, like, I don't know how to explain it. Do you still need a water canopy if you, if, you don't need a, if you don't need that water for the flood? Will it still be a necessary hypothesis? I don't know. I do know that people post, you know, have reasoned that, well, all this water up in the atmosphere um, causing, formed rain and fell on the earth. Well, there wouldn't be enough rain. You know, the water, if it fell over the whole earth, well, it raises the level this much sort of thing. And well, how's that going to cover Mount Everest? But this presupposes that um, Mount Everest was there back at the time of the flood and it wasn't created simultaneously with the flood or subsequently. And the Mariana um, Trench wasn't there. The what? And the Mariana Trench wasn't there. Yeah, and it's also, um, maybe there were movements uh, that to bring all the water up from the ocean, because it, it definitely mentions, uh, it does mention rain, but it mentions the floodgates of the heavens, and it mentions the fountains or the, uh, fountains something of the, of the great deep. Sorry, the what? Fountains of the deep. Fountains of the deep. Mm -hmm. So there were several, several sources of water it would seem that rain as we know it and all the water vapour that's currently in the atmosphere would not go anywhere near enough to do much, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this this you know, there's, there's been a whole lot of uh, thoughts about, well, how was the flood caused? And other people say, oh, well, it couldn't have happened because well, there wouldn't have been enough rain, you know, there's not enough water in the rain and so on. You know, this, this hypothesis to me does sort of add together a lot of things. Uh, it do, does bring some other things into the picture. Um, and it, I think it's quite plausible that there were, there's, you know, there's many planetary bodies out there now, and uh, comets um, you know, whizzing around and so on, and then disappearing. And, uh, and there is a lot of water still left in the crust. Yeah, it's crust. It's yeah who knows water how much subterranean water there is there. There's a lot there. of water, yeah. um, H2O in its various forms. Yeah. Deep down underneath us, as oil explorers find out. Mm. I'd like to explore more about coal. I've tried to do a bit of research about coal uh, as to how coal is formed. Apparently, they have in a laboratory created coal in you know the likes of hours or days. Uh, so coal doesn't need millions of years as it's been hypothesised. And furthermore, the way the coal deposits are around the earth, they're, they're all stratified. They're all in and in, uh, in strata, and they're very often in layers, uh, coal and then some kind of um, um, mineral material, um, sandstone or something, coal, and in some, in some places in the earth there's bands like this, and some of the coal's very thick, some of the coal's immensely thick around the earth. I don't know enough about it all, and um, I would like to do further research on all that. But both coal and oil and gas, um, uh, it's thought that oil and gas has actually got a vegetarian uh, origin uh, rather than coal. Coal is definitely vegetarian origin. But the, the main argument about coal that I've been able to find is was the coal formed where, where from vegetation right there or has it actually been moved there by something? And from what I gather, the little bit I've looked at, it, there's evidence to show that this vegetation was moved there by something and then covered and then there's maybe more vegetation covered and so on. Subsequently got buried by a huge depth, with great pressure, and, and then subject to heat from the magma, and that's created coal. And um, the, the thought, the suggestion that it's needed millions of years um, doesn't, that is not necessary at all. Just temperature and pressure. Temperature and pressure. Uh, and the difference between, oh, what did I also learn? The difference, the reason, the difference between Oil being formed, mineral oil that is, and um, and coal is basically one of how much water there is there at the time, apparently. Uh, but people have been spending all their lives studying this. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And and you're going to go in and I'd pick like it to. up in your old age, <laughs> <laughs> a part-time hobby. Yeah. And I'd like to. But the thing is. But the thing is, it's not settled. People say, oh yeah, coal, um, all of these deposits of coal, it's very interesting where they all are in the world too, but they're virtually everywhere. Um, but um, they don't, 
you know, the, it, it, the impression is given uh, in for many places that yes, it's all settled that it's needed millions of years for this to come about. Mm. And it's not necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. Yeah, well, one wonders how much a lot of forensic science is speculative. Oh. Um, well, it's a bit hard yeah. for us to tell, isn't it? That's if, right. Because we don't have access yeah, to really the evidence no, ourselves. And, and, but it's hard for the layman to actually make assessment as how reliable is the science that is uh, told us which we're meant to accept by authority. Yeah, I think a lot of it's questionable. Really doing a lot of stuff, especially presented in museums. You go into museums and you read what's presented there. It's all just presented over and over and over. It's just, well, this is how it was, you know, millions of years, and this rock, and this fossil, and this animal changed into that. And, you know, yes, it's all questionable. How, yeah. How much of it is evidence evidence. driven? How much is it ideologically driven? Yeah. We do not see fossils falling today. They are eaten by little bugs and microbes. Yeah. Go anywhere. There's nothing left in a fossil these days. So we're going to have a real cat cataclysmic buried yeah. really quickly. Uh, anyway, I think and we better wind up. Is there coal being formed today? Mm. Yeah. We better wind up.